Okay, I am calling to order this meeting of the House Children, Families, Finance, and Policy Committee. Apologies to everybody for starting just a couple minutes late. Um, I'm uh, Dave Pinto, the chair of the committee, and we're going to start, as always, with the clerk taking the role. We have a new person in that um, position, and Ms. Sparkman, if you can please take the role. Chair Pinto? Present. Um, Representative Keeler? Present. Representative Daniels? Present. Representative Bliss? Representative Coulter? Present. Representative Davis? Present. Representative Hansen? Representative Hemmingson Jager? Present. Representative Hicks excused? Representative Hudson? So these may have been on Zoom. Wow. I think uh, Representative Hudson is logging on right now. Okay. Um, Representative Katiza Batoon? Present. Representative Lee? Present. Representative Nelson? Representative Perez Vega? Present. Representative Zeleznikar? Present. Uh, we have a quorum present. Uh, excellent. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sparkman. And I will note if uh, we have folks joining us, uh, quite a few testifiers, but also some, maybe some members via Zoom, if people note somebody who was not present. Yeah, Representative Katiza, would you? Mr. Chair, I just wanted to confirm that the microphones are on, that people online can hear us. This ah. is a different room than we're used to, so I just yeah, wanted to certainly. double check. Uh, let's see. We've got somebody up. Can you give us a thumbs up if you can hear us? Mm. <laughs> oh, well. I think the AV is off. We think the AV is off. <laughs> Okay, we were told that the, the uh, sound was on by the sergeant, so we're going to check that out. We're going to see what we can do on that. Because, yes, thank you, Representative Katiz. We tuned. want to make sure folks can hear us. Okay, we're making sure. Uh, we've got Jessica Gilder on our, on our Zoom. If you can hear us, can you give us a thumbs up with your little Zoom thumbs up button? And also not a thumbs up. So... <laughs> which counts as a thumbs down in this, in this context. <laughs> so we are, we are working on it. Somebody online can hear. Okay. Well, that's good. We can just get, make sure everybody online can hear. Can we hear them? Oh, that's because yeah. Jess and Hudson are online. Okay. Oh, uh, Representative Hudson, we can see. Can you hear us, Representative Hudson? Or maybe not. Okay. Yeah, I, I do not see Representative Hudson giving us the thumbs up saying he can hear us. Oh, oh hey, there we go. <laughs> Representative Hudson just gave a thumbs up. So I am going to assume that, uh, that we can be heard. Just for the folks joining us via Zoom, can we had we some doubt them? about that. Oh, Representative Lee? Can we hear that? Can we hear you? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, Representative Hudson, would you mind uh, un unmuting and uh, we'll test with you, sir? Oh, you're muted. Okay. Testing one, two, three, Representative Hudson. We cannot hear you. So isn't it always, it's always technology. So we're working on it in the front of the room. So Representative Hudson, we are not able to hear you. I gather you can still hear us. So now we're going to work on both Back directions. Oh. Oh. Now we're hearing, okay, Representative Hudson, could you try again? Testing, testing. Yeah, I think I, there yes. was an issue with my mic. Oh, okay. No, we can, we can hear you. So, okay. And I'm gathering the other folks online are, are able to hear us too, I'm hoping. Um, I should note for purposes of the, uh, of the uh, roll call, I see Representative Hansen online. And so we want to make sure she's noted as being in. And Representative Nelson as well. I can't remember if he had been noted, but, uh, but both of those folks are joining us in addition to Representative Hudson in terms of members uh, additionally. And so um, can I ask um, uh, Jess Gilder, I, I see you. Can you, uh, can you uh, give us a thumbs up if you can hear us? Hey, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you too. Okay, good. All right, I think we're, I think we're all good. Thank you, Representative Kadiza Watoon. I think we have most of us. I know Representative Hicks is, is excused. I kind of think we have almost everybody else. Um, so apologies for the uh, for the delay there, but I think we're in good shape now. Uh, members, good to be with all of you. Um, uh, I'm so glad that we're uh, we're gathering. Um, so uh, just to, just to set the stage for today. Um, as members and members of the public are very aware, we made um, some really uh, transformational investments that passed through our committee and then through the House and the Senate signed by the governor in a number of areas within our committee's jurisdictions. That included um, helping Minnesotans experiencing homelessness, um, helping Minnesotans experience food insecurity, um, helping Minnesotans um, experiencing uh, uh, economic instability, those with, with kids especially, um, and making sure that our programs to address those needs are really enhanced. 
Um, we made significant investments, uh, and there's going to be more to do. Um, we know that there's more to do in those areas, and we'll continue to have discussions. Um, I wanted to focus today on an additional area, the area of child care and early learning, um, and have a discussion about that, and especially to get to hear from Minnesotans about the impact of what passed this past spring, um, both in the really good ways and then to hear about um, gaps that remain. And I'm, I'm aware of one in particular that I'll identify in just a second. So the plan today is, after I finish a few introductory remarks, we're going to hear from a number of testifiers. Uh, you've got a list on the agenda of the folks testifying. Um, and these are uh, community members of various kinds uh, from various <laughs> locations in the state. Um, to hear from folks, and then uh, we will then hear from um, someone with First Children's Finance who works uh, on the economics of child care and early learning, um, have a discussion about that, and then hear about a proposal to um, address uh, particular needs for families uh, going forward. Um, and that is the plan for today. We will not be taking votes. Um, we do not have bill language, um, but we have is, a, is an idea that we're going to be driving and, and leading up to. Um, before we begin, are there any questions about the agenda from anybody? Checking on that. Okay, not seeing any. So, so then just a few more just introductory thoughts from, from me. Um, as members will recall, we have um, uh, we had discussed in the spring that um, early care and learning is a crisis um, throughout the state. We're going to hear more about the ways that it's been a crisis for families in terms of being able to afford and access um, those services. We have also are going to talk um, a little bit later about what a squeeze it is for people providing this most critical service uh, in our society. Um, I just want to make sure to set the stage a little bit, though. If we go to the next slide, um, Mr. Rohrer. Um, the fact that this is indeed a crisis um, throughout our state. Um, if you look in the, um, this is showing the, the gap in, um, and my apologies, that the, uh, a little bit tough to read those, um, uh, some of the information there. Um, not quite sure what the problem is. Um, but this is showing the, uh, the white area in each of the regions of the state is showing the gap in the number of spaces uh, that are needed to accommodate um, children under six with both of their parents working. And we'll see that in the northwestern part of the state, where Vice Chair Keeler is from, um, there's a gap of 56%. In the southern part of the state, where Lee Daniels is from, a gap of 24%. And continuing all throughout the state. And if we go to the next slide, Mr. Rohrer, um, noting that this is a crisis for our employers uh, as well, not something we focus so often on in our committee, um, but recognize the number of employers who mention child care as a barrier to attracting retaining talent, um, that that is at least weekly in almost all regions of the state, um, with the exception being the southeast, where, oh, pardon me? Oops. Online is not able to see the slides. Okay, is what I'm hearing? All right, we're just going to pause for a second. They're online on the email. Uh, yeah, then they, they are with the committee page, but we certainly want to make sure that folks on the Zoom, I know we're going to have a speaker a little bit later who will have slides as well. We want to make sure that we get that addressed. So Ms. Colburn is working on that. I think what I'm going to do is um, while we work on that, I'm going to keep on going, and then we're going to see what we can find out. And members of the public who are watching online will attempt to put those back up for you. I will note the slides. It's just four that I have, or five, I guess. Um, that are on our committee webpage, so we encourage you to go there. Um, but just noting that employers mention child care as a barrier to attracting retaining talent, in other words, a, a, a slowdown for economic development, at least weekly in most of the parts of the state. Um, in the southeast uh, being an exception uh, that uh, they mention it uh, monthly as being most often, but a real, a real concern. So just want to remind folks, and this is um, uh, last couple slides. Um, if you go to the next slide, Mr. Rohrer, uh, in 2021, the state um, established a uh, Great Start for All Minnesota Children Task Force by the then uh, DFL Majority House and GOP Majority Senate um, to establish uh, three goals. And you'll see them, those who can see the slides anyway, uh, three goals listed, one relating to affordability, a system where a family costs for this critical service are affordable, another one, accessibility, making sure that, that access is not determined by the child's um, income in particular, but also where they live in the state and their race. And then thirdly, that the people who do this work are compensated uh, equitably and that they can actually support themselves uh, in the work that they do. So three goals, affordability, access, and compensation. We're working on having those of you online be able to see these slides. Apologies for that. And then when you're ready, Mr. Rohr, I'm going to have you, have you go to the next slide. And this is the final slide that I have. Uh, just, to, just to remind us all at a high level of the work that was done this past session. So we did a lot regarding access, um, investing in a number of different um, uh, programs uh, to address child care and early learning. 
including child care assistance, early learning scholarships, Head Start, and school-based pre-K. Um, uh, these programs and those investments were, uh, in general, aimed at kids from the lowest income and the most vulnerable families. And generally, that's the lowest 25% of incomes. Uh, we also invested in compensation through the Great Start Compensation Supports to increase wages and other workforce supports. So if you are just thinking, I'd said affordability, access, and compensation. We've got access. We've got compensation. Um, something that was not addressed so much this past spring was affordability for families. There was a proposal that was heard in another committee for uh, uh, child independent care tax credit, and that's something that did not end up advancing. And so. Um, we did a lot for access, a lot for compensation, less so for affordability. More to discuss that on that later in the session, later in this hearing. Um, but for now, what I'd like to do is then call on our various uh, testifiers and move on to that. Just pausing to see if anybody has anything else. Mr. Uh, Representative Daniels, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair Pinto. Um, th this this lot of work was done uh, this last session for child care, um, but, but I'm not sure if you are aware of the. Uh, Minneapolis Tribune that uh, article came out November 3rd with the uh, neglect and the, and the basically you know murders of these young people and I um, wonder if that would be something we could uh, put our attention to since we are in the business of keeping the people safe um, I read the article and it's just horrifying what these children have gone through um, you know the, the first one was a two year old girl was beaten to death by her by her mother, and then the, one, the second article uh, was a 17-year-old girl who committed suicide because she had been repeatedly sexually assaulted and abused. And so, just wonder if we could we could uh, spend a little time on that. Maybe this next session. And Th thank you so much, Representative Daniels, for raising that. Um, uh, yeah, and so I, what I want to do is encourage members, and thank you for calling it out. There was an article in the Star Tribune uh, starting a series uh, from last Sunday, so uh, eight days ago, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I think the series is called In Harm's Way, and I would certainly urge members, as you've said, Representative Daniels, take a look at the article. I'm happy to talk with members and work with them, and I would expect that certainly uh, we'll be considering proposals relating to child protection and happy to work with you and others um, on that. That'll definitely be something that we'll want to do this coming session and, and yeah, continue the, the, the discussion. So thank you though, thank you for raising that. And members, I really urge you to, to take a look. So, okay, so moving to the first testifier then um, is uh, Jessica Gilder from the Initiative Foundation Little Falls. We'll have you uh, please join us. And then if you can please just identify yourself and then uh, begin speaking. And by the way, I'm asking folks to, I think we've said, um, keep it to about four minutes if you can um, per person. And Ms. Gilder, please feel free to begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Pinto and members of the Minnesota Children and Family Finance Committee. Please um, just excuse the fact that I'm reading so I can keep it short. Uh, my name is Jessica Gilder and I live in Little Falls and I work in Little Falls and I was recently hired at the Initiative Foundation as the Child Care Solutions Program Officer. I came into this position after many years of being a child care provider and working in the early child industry. I still come seeking solutions for families. I come before you today though, as a mother, a grandmother, and an advocate for middle-class working families seeking affordable childcare. I ask that you also come before and work together with each of us on childcare solutions for middle-class families. The lack of quality childcare for middle-class families is not new. Many years ago, when I was a young parent, I was seeking quality, affordable childcare, and my qu family didn't qualify for childcare assistance. I worked in the early childhood field, and my husband was a blue collar worker, entry level. We decided to start a home childcare. In our business, we operated, we served Head Start families in a partnership program, and they were working families. When Head Start funding ended, we no longer had families who could afford the childcare and the quality that I had. They left, and I also left the business, unfortunately. I left the early childhood sector to work as a case manager in human services, and I worked with the Workforce Innovation Program Act programs, um, working with clients who were working towards employment and who many of them were women who wanted to work, but they couldn't afford childcare. Over the course of the many years that I've worked in case management, I've heard families tell me about lack of affordable childcare and how it's affected them, not just my family. 
I continue to hear these stories over and over. I witnessed how lack of access to affordable quality childcare not only resulted in job instability, but also poor mental health and child welfare issues, as you just indicated. I became a grandmother and I still continue to see lack of affordable childcare affect my family. My daughter quit her job in the healthcare industry because she struggled to find affordable childcare for her infant and toddler. To make up for lost wages, her partner went over the road truck driving. This doesn't allow for much family time and increased duties for grandma. Lack of affordable childcare continues to be a problem for all families, despite some of the recent direct funding directed towards the childcare industry. But these funds don't help families, not all families with affordability. The middle-class working families still need better solutions. I came here today because I recognize the need to speak for all people who are affected by the lack of affordable, sustainable child care. Quality, affordable child care is for everyone, not just the families who need it. For early childhood educators and care providers who deserve to be paid accordingly for the essential services that they provide. Quality, affordable child care is for employers who are seeking employees working in all sectors, all regions with varied shifts throughout our state. Quality, affordable child care is for all families, is for everyone who wants to build a stronger economy so that we can also all thrive. Thank you, Chair Pinto and the committee. And thank you for letting me share my story. I hope you join me in seeking solutions. Thank you so much, Ms. Gilder. Um, thanks for your work. Um, Carson Starkey is up next, and then after that will be Tracy Hill. I'll note that um, Amy Swanson is not able to join us, but there'll be another testifier uh, joining in person. Uh, so Carson Starkey, if you can please introduce yourself and proceed. Hi, uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the committee. My name is Carson Starkey. I'm the parent of two kids, uh, two daughters. One is a four-year-old, Llewellyn, the other is a one-year-old. Uh, her name is Dolores, so I live in St. Paul. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking you all you know, here at the committee for the investments that you all have made in the past year to continue funding voluntary pre-K. Uh, my four-year-old daughter attends pre-K at Nokomis North Montessori in St. Paul. Uh, we're thrilled about the experience she's having there. So uh, that said, my one-year-old uh, is attending an in-home daycare, and uh, every day I see the, the development and the learning uh, that takes place there in a quality home-based child care program. Um, my four-year-old attended the same program uh, as the one-year-old, so uh, it's called Kia's Love Bugs. It's run by a woman named Nakia Howard. We are very happy with her. Um, I'm of the opinion that it defies common sense that folks don't have public help for child, uh, child education until they, kids reach the age of four. Um, babies and toddlers are learning their care and education is expensive. Child care programs can be run like a McDonald's uh, in some kind of race to the bottom, but I don't think that's a good, pro I don't think that's a good model. Um, sure, these, these places are businesses, but they are also community institutions, and the people that work in them are contributing to raising our children. Uh, their work needs, I think their work needs to be rewarded as such. Uh, and if not for the good luck of getting a free public preschool slot, my family would be paying probably more than $20,000 this year in expenses related to early childcare. Um, and that cost can be overwhelming and can drown uh, a lot of young families at a time when they're just becoming established. So it isn't as if the hardworking people and small businesses uh, or small business owners who provide uh, childcare to my daughters are getting rich from that work, uh, far from it. The educators that care for uh, our youngest don't get compensated at amounts anywhere near uh, those folks who educate my four-year-old. And neither group is adequately compensated, in my opinion, for the invaluable work they do for our society. And so I would urge the committee to step in to correct uh, two glaring issues. Child care expenses crushing working families and the crisis of undercompensation for the workers who are helping to raise and educate our babies. So I appreciate your all's time and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Starkey. And uh, moving to Tracy Hill, and then after that will be um, Brittany. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, but it begins with a KJ. Uh, and so I'll call on Tracy Hill if you can please identify yourself and proceed. <coughs> My name is Tracy Hill. Uh, I'd like to thank you guys for your time and patience this morning. I'm coming to you. I kind of have a unique perspective, just like Jessica. I started off working in early childhood for 18 years. Um, right now, I am a Mimi recently. Uh, she'll be three. 
soon and we dip back into early childhood again. My teenager had a baby during COVID. Um, we weren't prepared. We had five, four months to get ready for and had no clue of what we were going to do for child care. Thankfully, we were able to um, Zaria in to bloom early childhood where I used to work at. And the director there, Mary, made sure that my daughter had access to a grant that provides child care for my granddaughter until she starts kindergarten. What a godsend that is, because we can't afford it. We're not getting any help from uh, Zaria's other parent, and it's pretty much on me and my husband to provide these things for my granddaughter. Um, I just want to point out that the, the common thing that I'm hearing from other people that are testifying is that we're all out here just trying to find some good and the key word I feel like is quality care in there. Not everyone has access to that, but like some other people have said, we all deserve that for our kids. I know for me to go to work every day, I work at a high school. And for me, my peace of mind is so good when I drop Zari off because I know she's gonna be so well taken care of. And I just feel like I know not everyone gets that or has <laughs> access to that or can afford it. I know for me, this grant has helped as far as my granddaughter and as well as my children when they were also attending early childhood because I couldn't afford it while I was working in an early childhood. I couldn't afford to send my kids to daycare and work there as well. It just wouldn't have worked without the child care assistance that I received as well. I just really want to tell you guys, I appreciate, you know, you putting in the funding for these grants. They're much needed, much appreciated. And early childhood is something that's near and, um, near and dear to my heart. And I feel like we should pour into our kids early in life, especially if we want to see things, you know, turn around for them. I'm on the other end of the aspect. I'm in a high school and you can see that some of them were lacking in early childhood <laughs> initiatives. So just we really appreciate the time and the effort that you guys put in to make sure that our kids, I know for me especially, get quality care. That's much needed and much appreciated. Thank you so much, Tracy Hill. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, uh, Representative Davis. Straining my ears to hear Tracy. Could we get just a little more? Volume? Yeah, we're, I think we've, th thank you, Representative Davis, for asking that. A concern is, is the volume. We've got the in the room as high as we can go. I might ask folks if you could please, thank you, Representative Davis, for raising that. Um, if we could please ask testifiers on Zoom to just do all that you can to be right into your microphone and speak as loudly as you can. Um, we'd appreciate that. Uh, the next testifier after this one will be Chantel Gruba from Iron Range Tykes Learning Center. But first, we have the parent from Mountain Iron whose name I was struggling with. And so if you can please identify yourself and proceed. And again, we're just reminded to, to be close to your mic. Hi there. Good morning, Chair Pinto and members of the committee. Good sound. I'm Thank you. <laughs> well, you picked a good one to go next and be loud. I'm very good at that. Yeah. Um, my name is Brittany Chenis. I live in northern Minnesota with my husband and three-year-old daughter. I appreciate the opportunity to share my story with you today. My daughter is extremely smart. I blame it on her child care center, Iron Range Tykes. It's why I drive 15 miles there in the morning to drop her off, 15 miles back home to work remotely, and I do the same thing when my work day is done. Because of the education she is getting, it is incredible. We have a few other options for childcare a little closer to home, but they are not high quality options. And sadly, I would have concerns for my child's safety if I sent her to one of them. Even just a small dip in quality can really be scary, which is why I believe so strongly that the high quality childcare should be available for all Minnesota families. Unfortunately, as you all are aware, uh, that's far from our reality. My husband works as a minor and I work remotely in healthcare supply chain management. We waited until we were in our 30s to start a family and financially stable. It is not an exaggeration to say that the decision was based on the cost of childcare. She is our only child and unless something changes in the cost of childcare, she will remain our only child. We pay more for childcare than we do our mortgage, and there's no way we could double that and still afford to live. There are a lot of factors that go into a family's decision about how and when to grow their family, and I never thought that childcare costs would end up being one of those that overrode every other one. It shouldn't be this way, and it isn't this way in nearly every other country in the world. In Germany, a parent is given three years of parental leave from their job and they're guaranteed a job to go back to and free childcare after. 
here, the fear that I would have is I wouldn't have a job to go back to if I opted to stay home with my child for the five years prior to school. Um, it happens all the time and mostly to moms to not have a job to return to. The only way to reduce costs for families is through public funding. Childcare providers are operating as leanly as they possibly can without compromising quality. There are no cuts to be made. In fact, to keep quality high, families are being asked to pay even more. Our weekly rate is increasing by $15, and that doesn't seem like much at first, but it's $60 a month and $720 a year, and that's a lot for families. Public funding that cuts the cost of childcare for families would be hugely impactful. For us, we'd be able to make choices again. We'd be able to buy healthy food at the grocery store instead of pre-packaged stuff. Um, we'd be able to have time to make healthy meals because my husband wouldn't have to work overtime to play catch up on our bills. Um, we'd have more time with our daughter. My husband would have more time with her. Um, if we paid a few thousand dollars less for childcare, we'd be able to take our daughter to the zoo, go see a movie, and even plan a fun road trip because we'd finally be able to, without the stress of how much money it would cost at the end. Um, we'd be able to <laughs> be able to have money to let our daughter take dance lessons or learn to play hockey or maybe even become a doctor. Um, we'd have room to breathe and we'd be back to making our own decisions about our money instead of having them made for us. Every Minnesota family deserves to afford their lives and making childcare affordable is a concrete and necessary step to making that possible. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Chenis. I hope I'm saying your name. I think- uh, You are, good hey, job. <laughs> excellent, thank you. Uh, after the next testifier will be uh, Nicole Flick from ABC 123 Child Enrichment Center in Dilworth, but first we're gonna have Chantel Gruba. So if you could please identify yourself and proceed. Good morning, Chair Pinto and members of the committee. My name is Chantal Gruba and I'm from the Iron Range. Besides being a child care center owner and director, I am also a leader with Kids Count on Us. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and share my perspective as a child care provider in Northern Minnesota on the many challenges in child care, but in particular on the issue of affordability for families. I have worked as a child care provider for over 20 years before building and opening my own facility, Iron Range Tykes Learning Center, in November 2018, with the mission to provide high quality child care in a safe and nurturing environment. We work incredibly hard to live out that mission every single day because we see what a difference it makes in the lives of our children and the families. But providing high quality child care is incredibly expensive. I just notified my families that we have to raise our rates to make ends meet because the cost of everything has gone up. Every time we raise our rates, we naturally lose families because they have to weigh the costs. At what point do they not make enough money to pay for childcare? At what point do they decide that in order to make ends meet, they need to find a childcare option that has much lower quality? This is a horrible decision to be forced to make. I have a family of six who recently pulled three of their four children from my center because of the cost. They found alternative care options of grandparents and relatives for those three children in order to afford the weekly tuition for just one child. To add to that frustration, this family and 98% of all of my families I provide care for have what are considered to be great jobs in the rural area. They work in mining and healthcare, but these great jobs are not enough for them to afford their lives and childcare costs are a huge part of that. Every child and family deserves access to high quality and affordable childcare. But as a society, we place nearly the full burden of paying childcare on families, which makes it impossible for Minnesota families to afford. The national recommendation is that families pay no more than 7% of their annual income for childcare. In Minnesota, less than 10% of families make enough money to say that they are paying no more than 7% of their annual income for childcare. Most families come nowhere even close to this 7%. I'm thankful for the steps that the legislator has made last session in funding childcare. The Great Start Compensation Support payments were critical in keeping childcare centers doors open. But childcare has been underfunded for decades, so we have a lot of catching up to do, and we have a lot of change that needs to happen before the catching up. For example, the reimbursement rate was raised for childcare assistance program. 
This was an overdue and necessary change. The income limit for families remains the same as it was though, which is far too low. A family of four must make less than 55,000 annually to qualify for assistance. That means a family of four that makes 56,000 annually doesn't qualify. How could a family with an annual income of 56,000 possibly afford to meet even their basic needs while paying up to 15,000 for childcare per child annually? The answer is they can't. It's impossible. Once a child starts kindergarten or pre-K, we collectively pay for their public education through public funding. Yet all the data shows that zero to five is the most crucial learning time in life. Childcare and early learning deserves public funding so parents aren't forced to choose between working and having children. Childcare providers are providing all the help we possibly can and families are bending over backwards to try to make things work. But families desperately need and deserve help. I'm relieved to know that legislators are making serious, concentrated efforts to address child care affordability for families this legislative session. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Gruba. Thanks for your work for, uh, for kids. And then our final uh, virtual testifier is Nicole Flick. Um, we're so grateful to have you with us. If you can please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. My name is Nicole Flick, and I own ABC 123 Child Enrichment Center in Dilworth right outside the Fargo-Moorhead area. I'm also a leader with Kids Count On Us. Thank you for the Zoom option because it's very hard to be able to leave, but the Zoom option gives us a chance for our voice to be heard. If you have a leaky roof, do you just patch it and hope for the best, or do you stop the leak, fix the problem, and prevent future damage? This is it. It's now or never. Because I can tell you that the child care providers won't be here when you finally put those preventative measures in place. And it will all have been for nothing and the damage will have already been done. Last session, we put money into helping the teachers receive higher wages. We made the Great Start compensation payments permanent. We put money into the child care assistance program and early learning scholarships. We got people who qualify for CCAP off the wait list. For this, we are extremely grateful. That was a decent patch on a big leak for the Twin Cities. Hmm. However, the CCAP rates in rural Minnesota didn't change because they were based on pre-pandemic rates from almost four years ago. Here's the problem. We price the private pay families or any family of four making more than $55,000 a year out of the market. And one of those parents are now staying home because the average cost of care in rural Minnesota for an infant is $17,000 a year. In the Twin Cities, over $21,000 a year. It's cheaper to stay home. You are losing your workforce every day. Every week, I get another family leaving my center to find cheaper, more affordable care. And when they realize it doesn't exist, they choose to stay home. And when, when I don't have enough children, I can't operate. The local public school in my area opened up a preschool in their school this year. They hired high school students at $15 an hour. They hired union bachelor degree teachers. They have school readiness resources like counselors, nurses, administration, professional development, I lost over 50% of my preschool class to this new program. Why? Because it's $100 a week less than what I charge. Not because they are better, because they are cheaper. They can afford to charge less because they raise their property taxes and it funds through the schools. I'm not charging people high tuition because I want to. I'm charging them what I have to to survive. So now I'm in this cyclone of doom I actually have staff since my enrollment dropped so much, but I can't keep them because I can't afford to pay them without a certain amount of children. If I don't have enough kids, I can't pay my bills. No one wants to pay seventeen dollars to $21,000 a year when they can stay home instead and figure out a one-parent household income. As child care providers, we cannot sustain this. Without staff, we don't get as much money for Great Start compensation. Without children, we don't get the money we need to survive. And we have created this cyclone vacuum where only low income or extremely high income families can afford care. According to Minnesota Public Radio, 50% of Minnesotans are considered middle class and make an average of $77,000 a year. You just price those 50% of people out of the workforce because they can't afford child care. Parents no longer have a choice of where they want to send their child for birth to five. They're forced to choose the cheapest option, not what's best for their children. Every child is different. Every program is different. Every family is different, and they deserve the right to choose where they want to send their child. You have $2.8 billion to spend. The government has no problem bailing out auto manufacturers, banks. You even build out the entertainment industry. Let's fix the leak and prevent more damage. 
Child care is infrastructure. We are the roads to the future. When will our children and families be the priority? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Flick. Thank you for your powerful words and for uh, your work for kids. I had the chance to meet um, Ms. Flick, uh, um, I guess it was a month and a half ago or so, two months ago, under leadership of her legislator, Representative Keeler, and, and uh, you can see the, the power coming through even virtually. So, so glad to have you with us. Um, so we're done with the virtual testifiers. And I'm going to call uh, Vanessa Robertson up um, to, oh, and there you are. <laughs> Look at you. Uh, and so if you can please identify yourself uh, and then proceed with your testimony. So glad to have you with us today. Um, hello, Mr. Chair and committee mem members. My name is Vanessa Robertson. I live in St. Michael and a direct child care center. I direct a child care center in Ramsey, Minnesota. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share both my personal experiences with child care affordability and what I see each day. Um, I do have three examples to share, a family I recently met, a family that I currently serve, and my own experience. Um, last week, a family did come into our school to do a tour. We were very excited to roll, and when we started talking about tuition, their faces fell. They were very honest about the fact that this was out of reach for tuition costs. I did speak to them about our child care assistance and early learning scholarships. They did say they'll look into it, but I haven't heard back from them, and I don't expect to, um, as this is something that happens pretty much all the time whenever we do a tour and it's out of reach. Um, the families want to enroll, but then they find out how much it costs per week, and then they find out they earn way too much to qualify for any type of child care assistance or scholarships. Um, the child care system is nowhere near affordable for a lot of them, and they're pretty shocked about that. I don't know what exactly happens to these families. Are they able to find a cheaper option? Do they not feel as good about that cheaper option that they have for their child? Do they piece it together with family and friends, or do they stay home? Right now, we currently have openings in both our infant and preschool classrooms, spots where we can take children right away, but the barrier we're hearing more often from interested parents is that you ju they just can't afford it. I even hear it from my own teachers who are parents too, and which is beyond scary, because if I lose my teachers because they cannot afford childcare, then that's even more families that's left in their lurch that can't afford it. At my school currently, we have a family, that's a family of five, and they have three children enrolled in our system, which is very expensive to have three kids. Right now, it costs them $4,824 a month for all three children, and that's for full-time care with a sibling discount, as they have an infant, toddler, and preschooler, which averages out to be $57,888 for a family to have three children enrolled full-time. Just for a quick comparison, my oldest son started college at the University of Minnesota this past year. His tuition is $16,178 a year. This family that I have has two parents that both work, but I honestly don't know how much longer they can afford that child care bill per year, which causes them to definitely fall behind on payments, which is hard as they rely on us and we try to give grace when we can. However, we're partners in the child care and education of children, but we're not being counters. We have to manage our expenses too, which we do try to give them grace and allow them to try to play catch up, but it is becoming harder. So for moments of time, they do have to cancel care and stay at home for a little bit. I don't know what happens to these children when they're at home. It is incredibly stressful for parents and children to have to piece together emergency care during those times. How exactly do they work while their children don't have child care? Um, I'm not really not sure how much longer they can do this, and I'm not sure how much longer we can either. And then finally, my own experiences with child care. I went through a divorce three years ago, and I needed to re-enter the workforce from staying at home. I'm a licensed teacher, and I was working for a school district, and I could not believe the child care costs that I faced as a single mother. However, as I was sitting down looking at my budget, I realized I could not afford childcare and I did not qualify for any assistance. It wasn't really easy because I moved here from North Carolina, so there was no family. <laughs> um, I did utilize a friend who was able to watch my daughter part time, and the other time she went to a childcare center for half the time. I was beyond amazed for how much it cost for just half time care. Um, but I was grateful to have a friend who could honestly watch her part of the day. But 
Even though I felt my daughter was safe, it wasn't necessarily the environment I wanted her in. When she was at the school, she was getting assessments, curriculum, learning experiences across all five domains of the child development, which is critical for children birth to grade five. Um, she also didn't have other children to kind of build social skills with. But it wasn't ideal, but I made it work for my family. And a lot of families don't have that. Um, I do believe it's beyond time that if something is done of growth amongst this big, huge group of families who currently can't get help for child care experiences. Quality child care isn't a luxury, nor is it a nice to have. I feel like it's an essential for parents and for children who parents need it. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much for being with us, Ms. Robertson. Thanks for your work in a bunch of areas. Appreciate you providing your input. Um, Mallory Plotz is our final testifier. No, the name is not on the list, um, but she had submitted a written statement, and um, we weren't able to be joined by a virtual testifier, so we're going to sort of substitute in Ms. Plotz. As she's walking up, I just want to note there's another um, written statement from a, someone who's not testifying, um, Daniel Roggi, R-O-G-G-E, hope I'm saying that last name correctly, but I'd urge members to read um, that statement as well, describing uh, his experience um, in terms of uh, needing to afford um, child care and early learning. So, um, and Ms. Plotz, if you can please identify yourself and then proceed with your testimony. Hello, my name is Mallory Plotz. A year ago, I started the process of talking to my legislators about the broken child care system. Although the field of early education is still far from receiving the pay they deserve, I was so grateful to see the continued support through the Great Start compensation payments for the child care providers across our state. It was also a relief to hear that low-income families have access to more support through the much-needed changes that were made to child care assistance and early learning scholarships programs. However, as a middle-class couple with two young children in need of child care, my husband and I have had many struggles with finding and affording quality child care in the past almost five years. With a combined salary of $110,000, which is not far over the median household income in Minnesota, we have faced many child care challenges. As a full-time working parent of two young children, my husband and I could only afford to have one of our girls in a child care center for preschool and only three days per week at $57 per day. Our youngest was home with my mom each day who chose to retire early to support us because even if we could afford to put both of our children into child care, there were no spots available for infants and toddlers anywhere near us at the time. When my mom <coughs> suffered a terrible break to her foot, and was in need of several weeks off for surgery and recovery, we quickly realized that we couldn't rely on only her for our, our child care needs and should consider putting our toddler into a brand new family child care that we stumbled across with an opening. We considered this option because it would be much more affordable for our income to have her in family child care versus the child care center that our older daughter goes to. Even though this meant two drop off and pick up locations for our two children. In order to afford this, my husband and I literally took out our emergency fund that we had set aside, and we planned to pull from that money each month to afford the additional child care expense that we were taking on. To our horror, the Friday before touring the new family child care provider's home, our 18-month-old toddler died in her sleep. Sorry, this was just no, we're... two months ago. Yeah. With her autopsy very recently finalized last week, we are now learning her cause of death is undetermined and classified as SUDC, sudden unexpected death of a child. I am still very much in shock that my story took this horrendous turn, as I am sure you are as well. But before I told you about our tragedy, I hope you were also shocked by the fact that two full-time working parents making $110,000 per year could not comfortably afford to have two children in childcare in our small southern Minnesota town. And we needed to pull from our family's emergency fund to even afford the three days of care per week for the two of them. It is clear that Minnesota families still need your help affording quality childcare. Please pay attention to these challenges and offer more widespread support. Unfortunately, my husband and I will no longer benefit from any changes made to support the middle class for child care because our toddler died before the state figured this out and our preschooler is heading to kindergarten in the fall. Although I have many new priorities on my list to advocate for now, I am still passionate about Minnesota fixing this broken system of child care. 
It is my hope that if nothing else, my testimony helps to drive home the point of all there is that we are missing with every day that goes by that we're not helping more families and children. Please take action to help other middle-class families that are facing the challenges that my husband and I did when trying to find and afford quality child care. Thank you. Ms. Blatt, thank you for being with us. We're so sorry for, for your family's loss, and, um, and we're grateful that you're, that you're here despite that, sharing your experience to help other families. That's really powerful and generous of you. And just know that we're thinking about you and your family. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, members, um, we have heard perspectives from a number of places around the state, a number of different people in different situations, um, talking both about the positives, about the investments that we made, and also gaps still present. Um, I'm going to turn in a second to uh, get a perspective from First Children's Finance, which works on the economics of child care, because I, I do think there's sort of a central question that may come up that I'll, I'm going to say in just a second. Um, I want to make sure if there are questions for testifiers uh, before, I don't know if some of them may have needed to hop off, but just to see if there are any at all. And I'm not seeing anything from any members, so we're going to move on then. Um, but again, so grateful to, uh, to members, uh, to the folks who came and, and spoke with us from so many different perspectives and, and shared them with us. We're, we're really grateful to you. Um, I'd like then to call up, uh, we're going to move to the, to the next portion of our agenda and call up Suzanne Pearl for Children's Finance. Thank you for being with us. And members, a, a central question that I was asking Ms. Pearl to answer for us is probably something that I don't think has been said explicitly, but maybe in the backs of many of our minds, which is, well, wait a second. How can it be that this service is so expensive for families, and yet it pays so little to people who do the work? Like, what, what is up with that? The logic just, we're confused by that. And so to have somebody with expertise to discuss that and explore that for us seems really, really useful. I feel like we did this a little bit last session, but to, to expand this, especially as we're moving into talking about affordability for child care. So, Ms. Pearl, if you can please identify yourself when you're ready, and then, and then please proceed. Uh, good morning. My name is oh. Suzanne Pearl. I'm the Minnesota Director for First Children's Finance. And, and sorry, I'm going to ask you, make sure the microphone is right close to your mouth so that those, those of us in the room and people online, it's a, and it can be a little awkward, but you want to just have the microphone right in front of your mouth. Yeah. Terribly sorry. Is this uh, better? It, it, it is better, yeah. You're, yeah. But even making sure you stay right close to it. Okay. Good morning, committee. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge yeah. the emotion in the room right now. Uh, yep. That's all right. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Suzanne Pearl. I'm the Minnesota Director for a nonprofit and community development financial institution called First Children's Finance. For those of you who may not be familiar with our organization, uh, we were founded in Minneapolis 30 years ago. We have now uh, spread to other states, uh, but we are headquartered in, in Minnesota. Our Minnesota program is the largest in our organization. We focus on the business side of childcare. Our mission is to build the supply and financial sustainability of excellent childcare. So while there are many in this room who will talk about uh, quality and child development, I'm here to focus on the financial side. Uh, I've been asked um, to, to share some information with you. I'm going to start with some uh, just a quick slide um, on affordability. Uh, one of our other uh, testifiers had possibly more updated numbers. Uh, you can see on this first slide. And let me uh, just, just pause you for one second just yes. to make sure folks online are able to see the slides that are up. I think Ms. Mr. Rohrer may be sharing the screen if he's not already, but just want to make absolutely sure. Um, let's make sure, make sure of that. I'm going to give this a try. Okay, I'm hoping. Representative Hudson, I'm going to ask you again. Can you give a thumbs up if you go? Oh, no, I can't see you, though. <laughs> Uh, somebody gave a thumbs up. Okay, good. I'm going to we'll count that. Okay. Um, so, Ms. Uh, Pearl, okay, so now we, can, now we know folks can see it, so please continue. Okay. Uh, the, the data on the slide is uh, from the Economic Policy Institute Child Care uh, Scoreboard. They uh, scorecard. They do one for every state. They, I think these uh, numbers are from 2020. Uh, but at that time, the average annual cost of infant child care in the state of Minnesota was more than $16,000 annually. Uh, that comes out to more than 21% of median family income in Minnesota and 30% of average rent in Minnesota. 
Uh, average cost of preschool care was more than $12,000, um, similarly expensive, uh, which means that a median income family with an infant and a four-year-old would pay 37% of their income on child care. Um, and you heard one of the testifiers speak to this. Uh, child care comes at a time when most families are at the beginning of their, let's say, earning potential. They're young, um, and this is one of the largest expenditures they will ever have at the time when they are least, amount, least able to afford it. Thank you. Uh, I and others have said on several occasions to this committee and in other uh, areas that childcare is a broken business model. There's a disconnect there. Families can't afford childcare. We hear that time and again. Child care businesses, however, have narrow profit margins. And this is a generalization, I'm not gonna lie, there are a few who are doing well. But by and large, child care businesses offer, operate on paper thin uh, margins. At the same time, child care workers are among the lowest paid in Minnesota's workforce. Why? <laughs> so, but, but what it results in is that the actual cost of providing child care is more than families alone can afford. Uh, in the coming slides, I'm gonna talk about um, cost, the cost to provide care, both in the family, licensed family child care setting and a child care center. Uh, the data comes from a newly released report hopefully it went public today it was supposed to go public today it is now uh, whether or not dhs is aware of that or not uh, every three years uh, dhs um, commissions a cost of what they call the cost of care study uh, in your packets is the 2023 cost modeling report first children's finance my organization uh, is uh, created the report uh, this year for the first time. Um, I will say it was a team other than my own. Uh, so I'm coming into this a little bit new as you are as well. But I will say that uh, in putting together the study, uh, my colleagues surveyed nearly uh, 1,100 child care providers. Uh, about 850 were family child care providers, uh, 240 uh, child care centers. They also completed business interviews with uh, more than 30 uh, child care providers, and this meant going right into their financial analysis. Uh, this is what my organization does every day. We do hundreds of financial analysis uh, every year for uh, licensed uh, uh, child care programs in Minnesota. Um, and just to set uh, the background a little bit, as of last week, there were about 6,000 licensed family child care programs across Minnesota, just over 1,700 uh, child care centers. That's from uh, publicly available uh, DHS data. And Ms. Um, Pearl, I'll just highlight for folks, the uh, Minnesota Co Child Care Cost Modeling Report is in members' packets, and I think available in the, in the room as well, and then posted online. As you say, this is something that really just, just came out quite recently, so this is nicely timed as well. Um, and so it's a pretty, pretty lengthy report. Members have that, and so just kind of to orient all of us. So please continue. Yeah. I will say it's an overwhelming amount of information, so take your time to go through it. Uh, one of the differences that uh, First Children's Finance did with this report in an effort to um, capture more of the variation uh, geographically, um, particularly in greater Minnesota, uh, the, the report studies data on different geographic levels uh, using USDA's rural urban commuting areas. Um, so it'll be urban, large town, small town, rural as you go through the part, as you go through the report. So let's, char let's start with family child care. Um, and this data is uh, pulled directly uh, from the cost modeling report. What does the budget look like? What is the expense breakdown? Uh, you can see here um, personnel expenses. And in this case, that's, that's basically uh, health insurance counting as, as uh, personnel. And again, this is an average. Not everybody has it. Some do. This is the average cost. Occupancy costs, um, this uses the time space percentage uh, that most family child care uses. Um, that'll be homeowners, renters insurance, utilities. Uh, you'll see program expenses are there and then administration expenses, um, which could be um, anything like telephone and internet, insurance, office supplies. Um, on the next slide, 
We're gonna show the difference between expenses and revenue. Um, you'll note that labor was not, or you know, a wage was not in the previous pie chart. That's because most family child care providers don't cut, them cut themselves a check every two weeks or 15 days. Uh, basically, how we know how much they're taking in is based on their net revenue against uh, expenses. Um, we'll take a closer look at that in the next slide, but I just wanna note that expenses are fairly consistent across different size communities across Minnesota. I thought that was a very interesting finding. So while there may be a variation um, in net revenue, ultimately you've got the same amount of expenses statewide. So this captures net revenue broken out into uh, an hourly wage. And it's interesting to talk about an hourly wage for licensed family child care. In our survey, uh, the average hours per week were about 65 hours a week. This is not a 40 hour work week. Um, and when you think about it, you heard some of the parents, you know, they've got, let's say, eight and a half, nine hour work day. You've got commuting time to get to drop your kids off. Um, and you've got parents working at all different times. You've got arranging different pickups. This is a long, long day. And then add to that, um, you need to get your supplies. You need to buy the food. You need to take your training, hopefully from First Children's Finance. We are free and develop approved <laughs> on the business side of childcare. Um, but there are a lot of external administrative uh, tasks that you need to do to run a business. So that's how that works out. And you can see that the uh, average rural wage in this report is $8.65 an hour. Um, small town, large town, about $10. And urban areas, uh, about $17. I'm going to move on to child care centers. And this uh, pie chart is based on an average 80 seat uh, center. It's a, that was the average size that came out of our survey, so that's what we modeled um, using statewide average expenses, including average wages. And you'll see here, uh, wages, benefits, personnel, that is by far the largest expense. And we've been saying this for years, about 70% of, of a child care center expenses, that it's labor, it's the people, it's the people who are caring for your children. And that's, um, that's the bulk of the cost. Occupancy here and is gonna include rent, building insurance, utilities, maintenance, repair and cleaning, other costs. Um, the other cost category, I think that's 17%. The largest category in other is food. And that's about half of that other category. Classroom equipment, program supplies, payroll processing, bank fees, liability insurance, other auditing and legal fees, license permitting costs. So that is the breakdown of expenses for a child care centers. Um, what you're all thinking, I'm just gonna say this, the state mandates how many people, are, how many educators are in a classroom um, and this is the cost to cover that. Um, they do that for family child care too. You have a uh, fam licensed family child care license, normally around 12 people, and there are some um, requirements for how many infants and toddlers you can have within that 12 seat. Similar for a child care center, uh, one adult per four infants, uh, seven toddlers, I believe, and then it's 10 preschool age. The next slide shows wages by geography. Um, lead teacher is the middle here, rural $17. It actually goes down a little bit for small town and large town um, and higher a little bit on urban. And I'm gonna note not all centers have all of these positions and the model, um, and they certainly don't have all these positions as a full-time. There are very few full-time accountants <laughs> in a childcare center. Uh, so the model uh, pulled averages. And the last slide. This is what it all adds up to. Um, here we have annual per child cost per each age group, infant, toddler, and preschool. Uh, we actually don't have a similar table for family child care. It, um, it was a result of the methodology. We're hoping to get something like this sooner. Um, so in the first slide, and what we've heard about, um, where parents were paying an average of 16,000 a year, 17,000 a year uh, for infant care. But if you look at this table, that really doesn't cover the actual cost. 
the cost is still there for infant care. Um, in rural areas, the cost for, to a business to provide infant care is $20,000 a year. Um, we often, uh, in our work with child care providers, businesses are basically trying to make this work for everyone. <laughs> They're trying to, you know, families can only pay so much, um, and they have um, ratios as far as child safety and quality care that they need to meet. Uh, so the, the phrase that we often use is that uh, when putting together your, your budget, you're going to lose money on infant care, you're going to break even on toddlers, but in, you need those preschool and school age kids to subsidize the cost of care for the infants. Uh, so those are the calculations that business owners are making all the time. One of our services is enrollment management. How, how number of classrooms and ages of kids, um, and it's a constantly evolving equation. Um, unlike public schools where everybody moves to a new grade on August 28th or whatever the first day of school is, um, kids in childcare have birthdays every day of the year. So uh, childcare providers need to be mindful of that, and you've got kids who are gonna you know, move into this room, but then you're holding that space, and another kid from your infant room is gonna move to the toddler space. It's a lot of work. Um, but that is just a basic overview of, of what the cost is to provide childcare. Um, you don't need to show that. The last slide is just contact information if anybody has questions or would like to reach out directly, and I will leave it there for questions. Let's um, just go back one slide if you can. I'm just going to uh, ask one thing and then and certainly open up and folks, this, uh, members, this will be time for discussion and questions. Um, I just, I, my understanding, um, Ms. Pearl, is that, is that because of what you described of sort of preschool families in a way subsidizing infant families, and of yes. course they all were different stages of the same families because um, yeah. preschoolers were once infants, um, my understanding is that if anything, the infant rate is artificially a little bit low because it's being subsidized. And then potentially that means other rates are higher because just trying to make it be that families can receive the care that they need um, just because of the cost. Is, is that, am I right in kind of understanding that? I've, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. So members, uh, questions, discussion. Uh, Representative Lesnikar. Thank you, Chair Pinto. And thank you for your uh, testimony. You mentioned that you weren't going to lie, that there were some that were doing well. Mm -hmm. Is that in a certain part of the state? Uh, is, that, is it for, for places that are single entity, multiple entities? Mm -hmm. Could you define what that means? Ms. Pearl. Thank you for the question. Um, and I can't actually <laughs> de define it. Um, we, the, the clients that we work with are not those. Um, but I, you know, I am aware of some programs who, you know, sorry, who, you know, serve a, a clientele that that can afford, you know, that expense. Um, honestly, I, I can't say I know more than a handful of them. I don't think that's anywhere near a significant amount of child care businesses. Representative Lesnika, follow up. Thank you. Thank you. And when you look at, that was my sense too, is because I, I don't hear that from people <laughs> across yeah. the state, that anyone is really doing well. Uh, so... I wondered if it was a widespread thing you see or isolated, and it sounds like it's isolated. I think the, the data here and what you just said, too, of the pre-K, one of the things, do you, we passed an initiative where the expansion at the school-based programs for pre-K, do you see that creating a void for uh, the, the staffing ratios and the revenue stability for existing centers, freestanding centers, if they have one center or five, anybody who's not affiliated with the school model for pre-K, are they going to be financially viable at a family center level and a child care center level for greater Minnesota or urban or any of these categories? Do you know the impact? Have you analyzed that? And can I just clarify your question, Ms. Lezikar? Do you mean without state support for, without a support for infant and toddler care? You're just talking about just if, if all there is is school-based pre-K? Or are you talking about if there's also state support for infant and toddler care? What I'm asking is the impact of the legislation we passed for the pre-K 
if the four-year-olds move from family-centered child care, three or four-year-olds move to the child-centered child care for the programs we initiated, what is the impact on the st stabilization financially for the family child care center or the child care center that's not affiliated with the school program? Because what I heard her say is that they don't make any money on infants, they make a titch more for toddlers, and they start to make money at three, four. If those three or four-year-olds are moving out of the model, my concern is what is the financial stability, and you sound like you're an expert. <laughs> so you know, you can help me yeah. understand. Because I'm, I'm analyzing this going, what is that impact in greater Minnesota for rural, small town, large, and urban? And is that an unintended consequence? Um, Ms. Pearl. Uh, first of all, thank you for saying I sound like an expert. That was really nice. Um, I will, the way I'm going to answer that is it is a real concern among the child care providers that we work with. We do an annual provider survey uh, in partnership with the Minneapolis Federal, Federal Reserve every year. Um, and we, we get about 1,300 uh, family child care, uh, family and center providers who respond to that survey. And uh, the growth of um, the voluntary preschool program is, is a concern. Um, it is definitely a concern within the, within the provider community. Um, I, I know that there, are, there is a, a stated um, goal of mixed delivery. And I think that's important um, that, that families have choice for the different types of child care. And that includes center-based and, and family, licensed family child care. Uh, we sometimes, to illustrate your point, we sometimes um, have people who are interested in starting a business. I know there's a gap in infant and toddler care. So I'm going to start a program with infant and toddler care. And then we run the numbers for them, and it just doesn't work. No. OK. I'm um, Representative Yeah. Yeah. Further. Thank you. Thank you. Because I for the last two months have been doing focus groups with child care centers and family child care. And their concern is uh, elevated right now. The stabilization grants and this, the initiatives that have done and, and met on many levels. One is the employees that they're employing may be on medical assistance and they are at, the employers are asking to not take the wage increase because they're going to lose their their heating subsidy, their rent subsidy, their SNAP benefits, and their CCAP. So they're asking to not increase their wages, so they have that issue. And they also now have lost people coming to work in the summers, so they could take a vacation because we passed the unemployment for the paras at the school, so many of them were coming to help in child care centers, so they don't have any backup, and they are losing people to teachers at the pre-K who aren't going to work in the freestanding settings because they want the benefits of the school system. And so I wondered if you're seeing that in your, your surveys from, because in rural Minnesota, we don't have a lot of centers as it stands. And we've lost 1,000 family child care providers in, I believe, a year for the state of Minnesota. So if that trajectory continues and we lose the places that provide infant care, and toddler care, my concern is where are the, we're going to lose more people from the workforce. And so I wondered if you guys have done analysis on that further, or if this is just all new. Ms. Pearl. It's a, it's a good question. I will say we have some of the, um, the increase in CCAP rates, the Great Start Compensation payments um, are yet, are still being rolled out. Um, we haven't done an analysis on, on, on those types of questions yet, as the policies haven't been fully implemented yet. Um, we, you know, we are, our business is to help child care businesses stay in business in the places where families need them to be. Um, so as, as issues come up, you know, we will be happy to bring them forward. Okay. Uh, so moving on, Representative Lezakar, moving on, or do you, thank you one final thing? No, okay, all done. Okay, Representative Coulter, you're up next. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will start off by apologizing for my voice because like so many other parents of young kids, I am recovering from a cold <laughs> that my daughter brought home from preschool. I'm um, sure Representative Hemmings and Yeager and Lee are yeah. glad to hear that. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're fine. 
You're just fine. Yes, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> Continue on, Representative Cole. I'm past the point of contagion, I promise. Okay. Um, by, uh, just one question, when, <clears throat> and I, I'm sure this is detailed in the report, but um, specifically referring to occupancy cost, um, I'm wondering if you could detail how much of that is sort of related to, uh, I guess, a, the, the term that I sort of come to is like capital costs, facili like specific investments in facilities and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, Ms. That Pearl. is, sorry. Um, it's, it's oftentimes rents, it's maintenance. Uh, we saw during the pandemic, there was a lot of deferred maintenance where people weren't taking that. Um, I sh should mention my organization is currently administering the facility revitalization grants program that came out of the 2021 legislature and the need has been immense for you know just to fix what was been broken. Um, this is one of the areas that is a barrier, um, not only for centers, but also for family child care in, in that facilities, they're, they're hard to come by and they're expensive. Um, particularly in greater Minnesota, we, uh, one of our programs is called the Rural Child Care Innovation Program. Uh, it's a community-led, facilitated um, process for communities to come together and find ways to support the supply of child care in their communities. And one of the things that often comes of that is a way to have community-sponsored, community-subsidized facilities. Uh, that's one thing that has worked um, around the state. Um, in, in, the, in the metro, it's, we, that program doesn't work in the metro. <laughs> We're trying to move it in because facilities, we see a lot of people who are interested in, in starting childcare, they just can't find a commercial property that uh, they can afford. And beyond that, they can't find financing when they do find a commercial property because you, you know, you're gonna go to a bank or, I mean, this is why we exist as a CDFI. You go to a bank with a business plan for a childcare, you're not gonna show a profit, mm -hmm. you know, till year two, year three. <laughs> and so it's a lot to ask a, a, a financer to, to take a flyer on, on providing a loan. Representative Coulter, follow up? Um, no, I don't have any follow up questions, but I, I wanted to raise that issue because I think this is, um, Something that it's something that I've been thinking a lot about in terms of, you know, the just the the costs of doing business and the costs of of making this something that's sustainable because there are these startup costs, but there are always these these sort of ongoing costs as well. And I was at an event, I think it was the one in Mountain Iron, where um, you know a provider mentioned um, that her refrigerator ended up going on the fritz and it was discovered at, a, at an inspection that it was like five or six degrees warmer than the regulation said it had to be for formula storage and all that. Um, and so she had to pay several hundred dollars just to fix her home refrigerator to, to be compliant. And so I think um, I, I just kind of wanted to raise that issue as one of those sort of hidden costs that I, I think as we look into this issue is something we're gonna address. Um, and then the last thing I, I just wanted to mention because I was curious about it, um, on the slide that relates to wages, um, minimum wage in the state of Minnesota for small employers in this year is $8.63 an hour. And I, I want to, and for large employers, it's $10.59 an hour. So I, I wanted to raise that because I think as we look at, at these wage numbers, we see in, re, in all reality that folks who are working in childcare settings in most of the state are basically making minimum wage. And I, I just think that's a reality that needs to be stated plainly. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Coulter. Um, Representative Katiza Wittun is up next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, um, I, don't, I won't go on too long because I know I get a little bit more time um, to speak about um, uh, me and Senator Housechild's idea and, and moving into a proposal for next session. But I um, have done a lot of calculations over the past few weeks um, just in terms of that 7% of annualized income that is supposed to be going toward child care and, and no more than that, right? I mean, that's what the Federal um, Department of Health and Human Services has, has set as the, um, the ideal rate. <laughs> um, and so I was looking at this, the, the chart that you provided, Ms. Pearl, um, the child care center's annual per child cost. Um, and I just, I know that um, algebra was a long time ago for most of us. <laughs> and so if you take any of those numbers um, that are listed in that chart there, and you divide them by 0 0.07, then you get a very big number 
that most Minnesotans do not make in order to pay only 7% of their annualized income. In fact, um, the Business Journal came out with some uh, statistics on the uh, the variety of income uh, earners and, and percentages of uh, Minnesotans just a I think it was last month, maybe it was September. Um, but the top 5% of income earners in Minnesota, like what you have to hit to get into that top 5% is $228,000. Um, so if you look at that, and then you look at the, the rates that centers or child care providers should be charging for infants um, in order to cover all of their costs, not even Minnesotans in the top 5%, you'd have to go all the way up to $297,000 for a family to not spend more than 7% of their income in a rural area. It's $340,000 annually in the urban, urban areas. And those numbers, <laughs> Minnesotans don't make that much money. So we have to, we really have to get creative here. And I think, you know, when we, when we just dig in and, and look at the data that's, that's been provided, and thank you so much for the work that you do to support child care providers across the state, Ms. Pearl, um, we need to um, have public investment. And I'm really excited to talk more about what that might look like. Thank you, Representative Cortez. We're tuned. Representative Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I, I just wanted to... I appreciate that Rep. Katiza with you and talked about um, the demand side. But I want to go back to the supply side, and um, I heard Ms. Pearl mention something about her organization being a CDFI. So I was just hoping she could explain that, um, and then also talk about um, the unique, I guess, challenges or like the different situation of um, you know what what a child care center is or a family based child care center is um, compared to a normal small business um, that might be looking for financing. Just so folks understand, like the like the, I guess, obstacles and hurdles that you would need to overcome to even like open a child care center. Okay, represent, uh, Ms. Pearl, thank you, Representative Lee. Ms. Pearl. Thank you, thank you for the question. Um, on the CDFI, we're a community development financial institution, which means that our mandate, uh, as far as being CDFI registered, is to provide financing. Uh, for, we are the only CDFI in the country whose entire portfolio is child care businesses. So we lend to low to moderate income uh, borrowers, uh, who in this case are childcare businesses. Um, there are uh, regulations about uh, the, the, the income levels of our target market. So as we, we provide um, loans, we did a lot of forgivable loans during uh, uh, the pandemic era. Um, can I answer more questions for you? I, I will just say that the, re the reason that we exist as a CDFI is it's really hard for a childcare business to walk into, for example, a bank, a you know a, one of the large national banks, with a business plan that says I'm looking for a loan, and if so, then they come to us because we know the business. We look at that business plan and we can say okay. We understand that you're not going to show a profit right in the first year, so let's let's work with you because we, you know, we we are looking at your financials and they look familiar to us, and so that's why that's the basis for our lending. Uh, Representative Lee, maybe follow up. I think uh, that's great. I'm also curious if people are listening and they're thinking about getting to this really difficult business. Um, what are the resources that you might have to offer? Uh, or where can uh, we go? Oh, Ms. Brill, well, community course. service here. So, Ms. Yeah, let me put my marketing hat on. Mm -hmm. So uh, we focus on the business side of childcare. Our lending, our loan fund um, provides uh, any number of small business loan products. We are an SBA lender as well. We are a USDA lender in greater Minnesota. Um, on the business development side, uh, we do um, any number of free develop approved online trainings. When I say develop approved, that's the state of Minnesota's professional development uh, system. Child care providers are required to take a certain number of professional development hours. Ours are develop approved and they're free. Um, we, our topics, we've got a startup boot camp. We do marketing, we do business planning. Um, we, for fam licensed family child care, uh, one of our most popular trainings is called separating your personal and business finance because obviously a lot of people just you know run their business from their house 
um, you know, they're shopping at the same time. Uh, in rural Minnesota, we have the Rural Child Care Innovation Program, uh, which uh, is, as I mentioned, a community-facilitated uh, solution to the child care gap. Uh, we also have a uh, cohort that is specifically for child care providers of color um, that helps to support uh, child care business owners uh, through uh, guest experts who are also uh, either banking and taxes and legal, uh, um, also from their community uh, to help promote uh, child care businesses that are owned by people of color. And I might, um, we should probably wrap up relatively soon. So, um, Representative Lee, anything further from you? Okay, Representative Hemmingson Yeager. And I think we'll probably need to have that be oh, Representative Keeler and then Vice Chair Keeler. So, Representative Hemmingson Yeager first. You? Okay. Thanks. I'll be really quick. Hopefully, these are quick questions. Um, I just want to clarify something that I might have misheard earlier. Could you just quick define the difference between family child care and child care centers? Sure. Right, um, yeah, Ms. Pearl. Thank you. I am always going to get wrong rule two versus rule three. Uh, licensed family child care is uh, mostly a child care program located within a home. It doesn't have to be. There is a special family child care license that it can be located outside the home uh, with um, a, a limit of usually 12 children, can be up to 14 children. Um, that's uh, <coughs> licensed family child care, child care centers. Um, are not home-based um, and have different uh, staffing ratios. That's usually, you know, you're hiring staff, you've um, got a director and a lead teacher and teacher's aide, usually larger. Um, is there so anything? I think that's, I mean, the, ba okay. the ba basic distinction yeah. makes, makes sense? Yeah, no, that, that's helpful because, okay, okay, so when I was going through all of the things with my kids, um, I always thought family child care was like home based only in the fact that, and then when I think Representative Coulter asked about occupancy, you mentioned commercial property. So I just got a little confused that, and I, I appreciate the clarification, yeah. so yep. that's helpful. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is possible. Quick yeah. clarification? Okay, yeah. Okay, and good. Then, um, yeah, Rep. Sometime is a year. Oops, sorry. Um, I appreciate the comparison with the pie charts. Mm -hmm. And again, kind of like as I'm thinking through this, like, how do we help all people in like the best way possible? Um, when I look at the family child care um, pie chart compared to the centers, um, it looks to me like it's kind of um, an issue of scaling. So as you scale up, some costs can go down, but then you're also gonna have costs go up other, other places. And I think that's kind of reflective in the pie chart. Um, I was curious though, if you happen to have, cause I love comparisons, um, slide five where you have the family child care bar graph of expenses and revenue. Do you have similar data for centers? Uh, Ms. Pearl. I'm going to say I don't know that possibly. Um, this report was just released, and I haven't made my whole way through it. So. Okay. Maybe what we can do is do some yeah. do some follow-up if necessary, oh, yeah. if that's okay. Okay, Representative Hemmingson, you're, yes. You got something One else? More. Yep, that's okay. And then yep. on the flip mm -hmm. side, I really appreciate the data that you had on the cost per child uh, for the um, centers. Do you have similar data on the family child care side? Yeah. Um, that one we actually don't. I think I mentioned earlier that the way that the data was collected and sorted in the data management software for family child care, it, it, it basically went cost by classroom. And so you've got infant classroom, toddler classroom, preschool. Family child care is only one classroom with different ages of, of children. So that's going to be, a, we're talking to DHS about a potential further breakdown to, to get at that at that level, but we don't have that in this report. Okay. Thank you for that. Thanks, Representative uh, Hemison Yeager. Vice Chair Keeler. Thank you, Chair Pinto. Um, I guess I need some clarification being from greater Minnesota. I need some population numbers. Like, what is a rule? What is small town, large town? No, I looked through the 69-page thing, and I didn't see it. Can you tell me what the population breakdowns are? And then my second question with that, and again, I'm kind of disappointed in DHS that we didn't even acknowledge any of our tribal nations. The way that we do child care with our tribal nations is extremely different. And so I know that we break it down then by town and then by region. The problem with doing that is it divides our tribal nations sometimes. So I, I think, again, I've, I've been saying this in a lot of spaces, you know, Making us invisible is the number one sign of racism. And I am tired of coming to these meetings and saying that we care about all of Minnesota and not understanding that we have 11 sovereign nations here and then lumping us together in greater Minnesota and not even, like you pulled your data from DHS 
And so like, if we're gonna do other conversations, we have to grasp our entire state as the state that it is. We don't dissect Minnesota just as these, these areas and these towns. So those are two questions, um, and I won't have any follow-up at the time, but I do just want to be really clear, I guess, as we have these conversations. I, I mean, I know that greater Minnesota often, for many people, just gets clumped into a thing, but we're very unique, and we're very beautiful, and we're divided in a lot of wonderful ways that I wish we would acknowledge in reports because to have 69 pages of a report that doesn't identify what's happening in our most poverty communities is an issue for me, and it really should be an issue for this community. Thank you, Vice Chair Keeler. Um, Ms. Pearl, responses to, to those two questions? Say, I really appreciate that comment. And um, on the first one, I can get back to you with the definitions of the, the four geographic areas. Please, please do do that. Do we have, I'm, I'm sorry. No, that's okay, Representative Keeler, please. Can we have somebody from DHS come up and give us that information? Because I, I really, I think it's important that we know, because we all live in, like, the difference between a 4,000 community and a 25,000 community makes a difference in what all these numbers mean. So I'm gonna need somebody, somebody has to know what these breakdowns are, and the fact that it wasn't identified in the report, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not gonna wait for somebody to send it to me. Well, let's, we can see if we have somebody who can answer today. I don't know that we do, but we might. Is there anybody here who can answer? Mr. Dem, come on up. Well, uh, as you sit down, I'll ask you to introduce you to identify yourself. Yeah, but you can maybe, uh, maybe Mr. Rohrer, um, or uh, yeah, why don't you, if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Rohrer, um, maybe have, uh, yeah, Mr. Dem, why don't you sit there? Ms. Pearl, why don't you stay up there? And <coughs> Mr. Rohrer, you may be able to grab a chair or something or just um, just wait for a second. Uh, Mr. Dem, if you could, um, uh, I don't know if you have a copy of the report, um, but uh, if you can please uh, answer the first question, if you're able to, regarding those definitions at all. Mr. Dem. Um, Mr. Chair, for the record, Nick Dem with DHS. Uh, Representative Keeler, unfortunately, I don't have those definitions on me. I'll have to follow up with the staff that were uh, part of this report. And we can do that after today's committee hearing. We certainly will want that, but Vice Chair Keeler, um, we certainly want you to, 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 to get that to us. Um, is there anything more that you want to add at this point? And there was, and then this, um, and then the uh, the second point as well about uh, any kind of breakdown in terms of our tribal communities and tribal nations as well would certainly be something that we'd be interested in getting any information on. Do you have anything on that right at this moment, Mr. Dem? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Keeler, I don't have that on me today, but it's uh, appreciate the feedback, and we'll be sharing that with staff, and we can follow up after today. Please certainly do do that. Okay. Um, let me see if there's anything else. That's okay. I'll look forward to that information. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair Keeler. Thanks so much for bringing that up. And, and thank you, Ms. Pearl, um, for your work. But Representative Daniels, anything? I know you often want to have, you often want to be called on uh, last. I just want to make sure in case you had anything. Uh, I appreciate that, uh, Chair Pinto. Um, it, it's nothing we haven't, a lot of this is nothing new that we haven't heard before. Um, I, and I'm going to be kind of blunt, and, and, and you may not like it, but um, I'm speaking as a uh, grandparent of seven children, and my youngest one is now in second second grade. So, and we would when my wife and I got married, and I think I told the story before, uh, we had three young children, and my wife was working at the Bemidji Kindergarten Center, and we figured out what the daycare costs were for three of our young children compared to what she was making as a paraprofessional. And we just decided that that wasn't the right path for us. So she quit her job and started watching our kids. And lo and behold, within a month or two, we had probably six or seven other children heard about, you know, my wife staying home. And I hate to admit this, but she did better in those years financially than ever working uh, for as a para. Um, and that was just part of our the decisions we made, you know. Uh, we had a motorcycle snowmobile retail shop, and I kind of ran that, and she did the daycare. And um, so I don't know, you know, and, and I, I'm thinking about all the, 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 I say you may not like this, but all the taxes that were raised this year. I know there were some on, uh, coming down on, on child care and, and uh, lower income, but, um, you know, we, we took a pretty big bite this year. The nine billion dollars in new taxes, and that's not going to help anybody directly. This, you know, thing was stuff here. So, um, I, I just don't want to see us trying to have government takeover of of our daycare centers, uh, family daycare centers, and uh, we talked about that several times, I believe. And 
that's just my my opinion, and uh, I don't mean to be rude or upsetting, but that's just uh, the experience I've lived through, and, and I just want to make sure everybody's aware of where I stand. Thank you, Lee Daniels, um, for those comments. And Ms. Pearl, thank you so much for your work and for the information you provided, and we'll consider you a resource going forward. Thank you so much. Um, and so with that, we're going to move on then to a proposal to address the needs that we've been hearing about. So we call Representative Katiz Ratoon to the front. And Representative Housechild is joining us via Zoom, I hope and think. And maybe we can bring him up as well um, uh, in some form. Uh, we'll figure that out. Um, Representative Katiza Watoon, I know that there's a graphic in the packet as well that says uh, uh, families need afford high quality, affordable child care now. I'll direct members' attention to that. And, and Senator Housechild, nice to have you with us as well. I know that's a little bit unusual, um, but we uh, we don't have a, it's not a bill, it's a, an idea and uh, that you and Representative Katiza Watoon have been working on and so glad to both of you here. So we'll start with, with Representative Katiza Watoon and um, if you can please talk with us about your uh, your proposal and your idea. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I think I'm, I'm actually it's really good timing um, based on Representative Daniels' comments about um, programs that will benefit Minnesotans directly. And um, you know, we we can all contribute so that families can benefit directly um, from a program like this one potentially. So, um, what we're discussing today is actively in the works in the lead up to this um, this next session. But being here today and being able to share the work that we are doing during the interim to reduce costs for Minnesota families is a privilege. Um, you know, we are a part-time citizen legislature, but our work does not stop when we leave the Capitol. And we are talking to families in our district, and we are working with advocates. And um, as a mom of four kids, nine and under, when it comes to the cost of childcare and early childhood education, I know that the struggle is real. Parents know that our responsibility to our kids doesn't stop when we punch the clock and go to work every day. And that's one of many reasons that parents of young children and, and being here and, and sitting at the Capitol and sitting on this committee, it, representation is so necessary here at the Capitol. So over the last four years, my time in office thus far, I've worked closely with Chair Pinto and other legislators, advocates, parents, child care providers, <coughs> and early childhood educators to bring forward numerous proposals for consideration. And I think you know, Chair Pinto did a really wonderful job highlighting the great work that we did earlier this year. It was truly historic in terms of investments in children and families in housing, in healthcare, in education, and in early care and learning. Um, I'm really proud of the passage of two proposals in particular, uh, the child tax credit and paid family and medical leave. Um, this, both of these, um, individually and collectively, have made Minnesota one of 14 states offering each of these benefits. So it's kind of cool. Um, our commitment to the children and families of Minnesota extends far beyond the bounds of this committee, but together, we certainly drive much of that work. And on this proposal, I'm glad to have Senator Housechild on, um, on with us today, but we're working hand in hand to create a bicameral proposal that will benefit more families across the state. As testifiers and advocates have mentioned earlier, we're seeing this tremendous gap in support for almost 75% of Minnesota families, those who earn more than $60,000 a year. And we know that families continue to struggle with the cost of early care and learning. The Great Start Affordability Program, and the name is in the works, but this is um, how I want to introduce it today to you, uh, continues our work, mine and Senator Housechild's, on the expanded Great Start Child Care Tax Credit that um, did not make it to the finish line last year. So this is an alternative way in lieu of a tax credit to get much needed dollars back in the hands of Minnesota families and address the cost of child care. So Great Start affordability subsidies will be designed on a sliding scale in terms of annualized income and number and age of children. We talked a lot about the 7% number. Um, I, I mentioned that earlier in my testimony. So, um, but basically it's just to say that no family should have to spend more than 7% of their annualized income on child care and early learning. Um, a well-recognized financial recommendation is that individuals shouldn't spend more than 30% of their income on housing, whether that's a rent payment or a mortgage payment, et cetera. Um, and in reality, it, both in my lived experience and some of the testifiers earlier, Across Minnesota, um, it's showing that some families spend almost twice their mortgage payment or even that amount um, on childcare alone. 
So the Great Start Affordability Program will help families um, like Daniel, who's a single father of two working boys. He couldn't be with us today, but his testimony is in our packets. Um, they earn beyond the level of subsidies provided in Minnesota currently and continue to support these same lower income families. Daniel was denied an existing early childhood scholarship because he earned $63,000 a year. He wishes he could be here with us today, like I said, but much of the design, much like the design of our Great Start <coughs> Child Care tax credit, the Great Start Affordability Program aims to fill this gap for families who still can't make ends meet, and it will provide a subsidy directly to child care providers on behalf of Minnesota families based on the enrollment and participation of one or more of their children. The subsidies will be scaled by income, and we will be working closely with advocates as well as the Children's Cabinet and the future Department of Children, Youth, and Families in order to determine the system and the frequency of these payments. The hope is that the Great Start Affordability Program can utilize the existing system of early childhood scholarships, which continue to receive <laughs> incredible bipartisan support, um, particularly from members of this committee, so I appreciate that. Um, and using an existing system would also allow us to get these payments out much quicker, um, ensuring that families see lower childcare costs as soon as possible. Um, I just appreciate all the sentiments from parents here who, who took the time to, to talk with us, um, the providers who shared the day-to-day -day experience of being a business owner, and most of them are parents themselves. And Ms. Pearl's presentation was so helpful in grounding this conversation. Um, your thoughts are welcome as we continue um, discussions on this proposal, and I'd be happy to discuss just how much the Great Start Affordability Program would benefit families in your community. Um, the work that we've done and the work that we still have to do impacts the children and families across the state in each and every district every day. And I look forward to your support for the program. Thank you so much, Representative Katiza Wittoon. Um, Senator Housechild, we're pleased to have you with us and appreciate your partnership with our committee member and, and colleague and your commitment to this issue. I invite you to, to say a few words now if you'd like. Thank you, Chair Pinto and Vice Chair Keeler for holding this important hearing. Um, as it was said, my name is Grant Hochschild, and I'm the state senator from the most rural Senate district in Minnesota. I have the privilege of representing the East Iron Range, two tribal nations, the North Shore, Superior National Forest, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, five big counties, uh, and many rural communities across the Northland. Um, but more importantly than my public service is my personal commitment as a father. Um, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Um, my wife is a nurse, which is a very busy professional commitment. Um, from being on call and working long hours, uh, her job is not one with flexibility. And given my own service, our reliance on child care is critical. But it's not just my personal experience. I've attended three child care roundtables across my district over the last year, including at Ms. Chantel Gruba's Iron Range Tykes Learning Center. So thank you to Chantel for having us. Um, and whether I'm on the Iron Range, the North Shore, or in the suburbs just outside of Duluth, I continue to hear about the struggles families are facing with child care. It's by far in the top three issues that I hear about on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition, we have prospective employers that I'm aware of who are trying to open pretty large uh, businesses from industry and manufacturing uh, to mining adjacent industries that are facing big challenges in opening because of housing and child care. Child care, as we've heard in all the previous testimony, is clearly a market failure. We can't pay those helping raise our kids enough to afford their lives in our own communities, and that can't continue. On the flip side, our families are spending more on child care than their mortgages. Again, that's unsustainable, and we have to address it. Families like mine, uh, my wife and I uh, have considered having a third child, and I talk about it openly. We have decided not to do that at this time because of child care costs. And I know that there are many families around Minnesota who are in the same boat. And with less and less people able to start families, we're seeing a drastic decrease in local growths of our population. This will just exacerbate workforce challenges, force families to start later and provide less opportunities in our communities. So I'm really, really proud to work with Representative Carly Katizia Withun on the Great Start Affordability Program to help support families making 150% of the median state income better afford childcare. While the details have been expressed by, uh, by the previous speaker, uh, I do just wanna make one critical point. While we did a lot for childcare this last session, especially as it relates to childcare center stability and support for families and children most in need, 
we also need to support middle class families who are struggling to make ends meet. Thank you to those of you who testified from Northeastern Minnesota. We have seen in the previous, previous testimony that our rural communities, I think, face nearly identical costs for childcare, but far less revenue. Um, and making the economics work in our rural communities is just frankly harder. Just like it's harder to spread costs for school levies, hospital taxing districts, emergency medical services, and so much more. But this isn't just a rural issue, it's a statewide and national issue. If we want Minnesota to be a place, the best place to raise a family and support businesses, workforce, and our economy, we must address the child care affordability crisis. I hope you'll join us in working to support families in this next session with the Great Start Child Care Affordability Bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Senator House Child. A, a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, and many thanks to you and Representative Katiza Wittoon. So members, um, questions or comments about the uh, the proposal and the idea? Again, this is not yet in bill form. And I heard um, Representative Katiza Wittoon, and I think Senator House Child as well, express a great interest to receiving input, um, not only from members of the committee and the legislature, but from members of the public to hear um, what folks think about this. But are there questions for them or comments that folks may have? Repres uh, Vice Chair Keeler, please. Thank you, Chair Pinto. Um, Representative Carly Katiza Watoon, have you talked to the chamber regarding this? Where, where do they stand on this idea? Uh, oh, Representative Katiza Watoon. Thank you, uh, Representative Keeler, for the question. I haven't had a direct conversation with the Minnesota Chamber at this point in time, but we've been working closely with advocates who um, speak with the business community um, over, the, over the past couple months. I've been a big year. Uh, Vice Chair Keeler, yeah. Sure. So one of the things that I've been working on for three years is kind of similar to Kentucky did um, a bill kind of braiding these different worlds together because I think when we look at affordability, it is not just the parent and just the state's obligation to help our workforce, right? Like we go to daycare so that our parents can go to work, yet the chamber is nowhere in here and all of us go to work for most of the businesses in the state. And so I think we're missing this braided strand, right? Like if we braid three areas together, including the chamber, including our businesses, I know Nicole Flick from ABC 123, you know, I, I live in Fargo-Moorhead. We are very divided on a lot of things when you go across the river, but figuring out how our, our big employers invest in childcare matters too. And so I think that um, we, we have to be really mindful that it can't always be the parents in the state that foot the bill. I mean, we, we have giant corporations that make a massive profit based on the workers, and then our, our families are really left picking up the bill. And so I would encourage um, you all, us all, to, to get the chamber here. Talk to them. Talk. I mean, I know my chamber, in every single conversation I'm in, they're like, oh, child care, child care. Yet they don't show up here in ways to support us. Um, and I think that we really have to think differently about that, and I think we need the braided approach which, with our chamber and businesses in general. Thank you. Thanks, Vice Chair Keeler. And I'll maybe note, I know the Minnesota Business Partnership and Chamber have, this has been a, a big, um, something that they've both um, spoken a lot about and have been, I've certainly been in contact with them through the years. Um, and uh, I know, you know, to be candid, right, there is a balance in terms of willingness to spend um, for there to be a public investment sometimes. Um, uh, but, uh, but in terms of sort of the need, I've definitely been hearing that. And so we'll have to continue those conversations, certainly. Um, yeah, um, other members' uh, questions or comments? I'll reference Les Lesnikar. Thank you, Chair Pinto. And thank you, Senator Haas-Geld and, and Representative. I'm, child care is a very important thing to me. Granted, my kids were in family child care and center child care quite a few years ago. They're 29 and 27. But this is the number one thing I hear about for all of northeastern Minnesota and for everybody I know that lives across the state. So I think it's important that we do it. I think one of the things that we're not talking about is when you look, I've spent a tremendous amount of time reading the statutes for child care, what we require, the requirements for family child care and the requirements have to be analyzed because mandates cost money. And we have, over the years, increased so many mandates to centers and also to family child care, and you can see the cause and effect. At the same time, we're trying to grow it and so we have to look at what these mandates say. I've been spending time in centers, and I, quite frankly, yesterday had another uh, town hall in northern Minnesota, and I had seniors come who were completely appalled that they couldn't be, as a mother and a grandmother, they couldn't count in the staffing to, be a, to work, to care for infants, to hold a baby six weeks to 16 months old, that they don't meet the criteria as an aide. They aren't 
They have to have a one to four ratio, one teacher. So we have a workforce shortage and a childcare for shortage with standards that quite frankly are appalling to people who have been a mom. They don't qualify. You, you can't use the credit for experience for volunteering, being a certified nursing assistant, being a para, being a mother, me being a nursing home administrator. None of that's gonna count if I wanna go work in a childcare center. So uh, we have to really look at what we're mandating and what counts and who, who we're leaving out as being a great childcare provider, because I've used both. And the other thing we're not talking about is 40% of our state has increased mental health needs. So adding all these requirements to have, just not looking at social needs, not looking at emotional needs, just academic needs are one part of a child's development. And if 40% of our kids and adults have mental health issues, to expect that we're only gonna be looking at it from an academic thing, I think is really short-sighted. They need nurturing, they need socialization, they need the basics, and some of them are fantastic in the homes. I would suspect that many in the tribes, in the, tri in the tribal communities use home-based model, as Greater Minnesota does. In most of the areas I'm in, there's one center. There's one center in two harbors. There's one center in many places. And I just got a text from one up there that said, the only way they're staying open is by giving teachers free childcare. They can't meet the mandates, and that's 15% of their revenue, and they're all about to go under. And we haven't implemented the FMLA. So we have to really look at what we are mandating for the centers, because the cause and effect is gonna be devastating if we don't look at both. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lesnikar. Representative Perez Vega, you're up next. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative, for uh, bringing what a game plan of initiatives we have, we all have in this committee to work on. But I want to make sure that we, you know, get a vibe of including workforce policy with child care policy. Mm. Okay, this is about rural Minnesota. This is about urban cities. This is my district to the res. If we are providing project development that is coming from our workforce throughout this entire state, there has to be implementation that if you got a job, that job is also going to supply some of that bread, some of that funding for you to be able to keep that job and so that your kid has a great upbringing, so that there is cultural competencies in these child care centers, whether they are uh, 50 kids to 100 or the 5 to 10 that are in those rural communities. So we really have to connect those dots of where we're putting funding has to got to put more into the pocket of not the just only the, 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 the workers or those grants for those that are going to be getting those licenses, but for our youngest Minnesotans, whether their parents make a certain amount of money or not. We are all struggling here. This is obviously the beam of attention that is a national crisis right now. So let's take a, a, a moment to take how we can get the pros uh, of what we've been able to do so gratefully this past session and really uh, stop creating these pits in, 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 the, in, the, in the shoes of, of these kids and, and these child care workers and the future of what child care looks like. Um, we can have these answers here clear. We just got to connect the dots a little bit better and level that where funding is going, funding is also going over here on this side. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Pera Vega. Other questions or comments from members? Representative Coulter. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, to, to sort of start off here, Representative Zalesnikar, I've been working on some of these license, licensing and, and inspection issues, and, and I would say you're not entirely wrong. I think there, you know, there are some serious issues with um, the way these statutes are written, the way they're enforced. I think to what I have seen, a great deal of that challenge, frankly, comes from the fact that we have... 87 counties and we have 87 separate licensing enforcement agencies that that you know even uh, different licensors can interpret things in different ways and I, I think there absolutely is a better way to do that system and so I'm, I'm happy to partner with you on that work we can we can talk offline about that as well um, you know I, I mentioned I was up at, at um, the event that that Senator Hosschild mentioned at um, at Iron Range Tights in, on Mountain I in Mountain Iron and I was also able to get out to an event in New Ulm. And, you know, what, what I have heard, and I've heard, you know, from, from providers and, and so on in my own community as well, and being a parent of young kids, I have lots of friends who are parents of young kids, and, and so I, you know, I see and, and live this reality every single day. 
Um, in fact, I at one point nearly thought I was going to have to miss a good portion of one of my own committees to make sure that I could have child care for my own kid at home. So, you know, I, I think there, there are a lot of pieces to this puzzle, but um, I think at, at the end of the day, you know, we, we just need to recognize that we do need to make a stronger community investment, whatever that community means, in what really is an issue of community success and stability. And, um, you know, I, I, I think we, we ask so much of providers, we ask so much of parents, um, but everybody benefits. Everybody matters in this equation. And everybody interacts with the, with the early care and education system at some, in some way in this state. And so, um, you know, I am, I am grateful to see this, this coming forward. I think this is um, something even my local chamber has talked to me about. And even rooms where there are not a lot of parents of young kids, folks are noticing what this means for, for communities. And I think, um, you know, we, we, I think we all value families. We all value strong and, and stable and successful communities. And the reality is that this lack of, of investment is holding a lot of folks back in really big ways. And I think we, we, we owe it to our neighbors and, and our families and our, our communities to, to take action. So I'm excited to see where this goes and, and would love to be part of this conversation. Thank you so much, Representative Coulter. And I will say, members, we're going to end right at 1230, so we're going to keep things pretty brief. But Representative Lee, uh, you're up next. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, very quickly, um, as someone on tax committee and someone interested in tax policy, I just wanted to uh, commend the authors. I know there isn't a bill yet, um, but I appreciate um, moving away from the model of a tax credit just because, I mean, we've heard today from all the families that testified, um, their budgets are really tight. And again, it costs a lot of money. So um, even if we did have a really generous tax credit, that means these families have to spend money up front throughout the whole year and then wait a whole year to be, you know, reimbursed or to see that uh, refund, right? And so um, do appreciate that. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that because I know there isn't language yet, but um, that's actually a real issue for families as well because um, you, you need that money for other things, right? And so um, do appreciate the, this new idea. Thanks, Representative Lee. Yeah, and I kind of alluded at the very beginning to the tax credit and now, so maybe Representative Katiza Wittun, do you just comment on that point? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Lee, for bringing that up. This this is a, a huge piece of this proposal um, that, that these subsidies would go directly to child care providers, and they would be um, so. Actually, this um, the handout um, that was created by a number of our advocates um, doesn't have all the details. Obviously, we're still working on um, what the language would look like, but um, the, it, the aim is to pay providers up front and to credit families on their monthly invoice. So, you know, when you get your invoice or, or whatever it would be, then it would say, like, Great Start Affordability Program, like, minus $100 or whatever it, whatever it might be, if it's, like, weekly, monthly, you know, and so we're still working out the details on the frequency of those payments, but it is up front, so that money is going back into families' pockets right now instead of them having to wait until the following tax year to, to get that money back. Um, so it's, it is going to make a really big impact. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, we're getting ready to wrap up here. So uh, Lee Daniels, give you a uh, final word for you, and then we'll go to the bill author of a comment, if, if you do have anything, sir. Thank you, Chair Pinto, and, and thanks for the discussion today. It's uh, it definitely a, an issue for uh, the entire Minnesota for day, daycare affordability. And uh, the only thing I'd probably say at this point is, is this, let's not lose sight of the, the TRIB article that came out on the 3rd of children that are being murdered by, you know, they should have never put back in their, in their home, and that's, we need to put some more emphasis on that and, and protect these children that are, um, I mean, our foster care going back to home and and uh, being mistreated. So, I'll, I'll just end with that. Good. Thank you so much, Rep Representative Daniels. Yeah, um, plenty of uh, plenty of things to be to be working on. Um, Representative uh, Katiza Watoon and I suppose Senator Housechild, a final word from you, if you can be uh, pretty quick about it. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and members, for participating in this conversation today. To all of the families and advocates and providers who um, elevated their experience and expertise, I think that. Um, as we, as we work on shaping the bill language, we're gonna need all of that input, and so um, that testimony is so powerful. And one thing that I do really wanna circle back to and, and flag was that how, um, 
just how incredible it is. You know, we had mothers talking about how they are, how difficult it is to talk about family planning decisions. People are making a decision how big they want their family to be. Maybe they, you know, when, when um, I have a story, you know, my mother um, was a stay-at-home mom for m most of um, my early childhood, she, and she actually has a degree in early childhood education. She did a little bit of in-home care for some of our neighbors at, at some point in time, but um, she, she told me this story. She was cleaning the toilet cleaning one of the toilets. That's one of the things that parents have to do, right? I'm trying to explain to my kids all of the different chores that mom and dad have to do if we don't all chip in and do some of that work. Um, but she said, she said, then you were just there. You kind of waddled into the, the bathroom and said, mommy, I want to be just like you when I grow up. <laughs> and she's sitting there, you know, she probably hadn't showered that day. She's wearing sweatpants. She's scrubbing a toilet. And she's like, I want so much more for you than this, but um, that's important work. And whether people do it for pay or whether they do it because that's a, a role in their in their family household, it's critical. Um, and and I think that when people when kids look at their parents and say, "I want to be a mommy or a daddy when I grow up," and they think, "Oh, maybe I'm going to have one kid. Maybe I'm gonna, maybe I want a big family." My daughter told me she wants to have a hundred kids. I said, "Honey, that's a lot of kids." It's a lot of kids, and, and my, my kids know really well. I mean, we struggled through some fertility issues, so I told my three kids who were adopted out of the foster care system, um, I said, you know, mommy's belly doesn't really work that well, so we, we might not have another baby, and then lo and behold, we did. Um, and so it's, it's just such a blessing that we were not forced to make a decision about our finances and our family planning based upon that. So I think that when we highlight parent choice and family planning, um, we, we really want to make sure that families don't have to do that and, and that the best way to um, support them is by making public investment. Every child in Minnesota deserves a great start to life, and we all do benefit directly or indirectly um, when that happens. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Thank, thank you, Representative Katiza for tuning, pardon me. And uh, Senator Housechild, um, we're grateful to have you. Might, if you can keep it really, really short. I, I just want to thank you for allowing me to uh, crash a House hearing on this important topic. I can't do any better than uh, Representative uh, Katizia Wathun on those comments. So uh, looking forward to working on this this next session and, and talking to all of you about the idea. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. So members, in a couple of weeks, there's going to be a, a supplemental budget forecast, and we'll get a better sense as to sort of what the fiscal picture is likely to look like in uh, the 2024 session. Um, but I guess I'm sort of putting a flag down that there's um, there's substantial needs in the area um, covered by our committee. This is certainly um, one of them. Um, and so we need to continue the conversation. Um, I know Representative Katiza Batoon, Senator Housechild, eager to hear input and thoughts about this particular proposal. There will likely be others as well. Let's continue to be in touch. And grateful to everybody for taking the time, including members of the public, for joining us. So with that, members, we are adjourned. Okay, here we go.